Hello, and welcome to First Lutheran Church in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Today's sermon is for Sunday, October 4th of 2020. This Sunday, Pastor Prangy is preaching on Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. The sermon theme is, Because He is Generous. As you listen to the sermon, think about the following questions. Why did the priest in Juxenthal convert? And how does God's generosity impact our lives today? Thank you for joining us, and may God bless you as you hear and study the Word of God, so that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Prangy. Today, we join the whole Christian church on earth in celebrating God's graciousness as unending. We'll use the order of service that's printed in your bulletin and projected on the screen. And for our first hymn, we'll sing, Grace Has a Thrilling Sound. sound to each believer's ear, that peace with God through Christ is found, is news I gladly hear. Grace first inscribe my name in God's eternal book. And grace has brought me to the Lamb who all my sorrows took. Grace led my wandering feet to tread the heavenly road. And grace supplies each hour I meet, all pressing unto God. Grace taught my soul to pray and made my eyes o'erflow. His grace has kept me to this day and will not let me go. Grace all our work shall crown through everlasting days. The heavenly home God gives his own shall echo with our praise. O Lord, open my lips. My mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. Praise be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. 
the heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. You may be seated. The first lesson read around the world this Sunday, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked man abandon his way. Let an evil man abandon his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will show him mercy. Let him turn to our God, because he will abundantly pardon Certainly my plans are not your plans, and your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my plans are higher than your plans. The word of the Lord. In response, we join in singing Psalm 27, as printed in your bulletin and projected on the screen. and my salvation of whom shall I be afraid of whom shall I be afraid hear my voice when I call O Lord be merciful to me and answer me do not hide your face from me Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid? Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 9. This does not mean that God's word has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are really Israel. And not all who are descended from Abraham are really his children. On the contrary, your line of descent will be traced through Isaac. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are counted as his descendants. For this is what the promise said, 
I will arrive at this set time, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah also had children by one man, our forefather Isaac, even before the twins were born or did anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might continue, not by works, but because of him who calls us. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Does this mean that God is unjust? Absolutely not. For God says to Moses, I will show mercy to whom I show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. The word of the Lord. In response, we sing the verse of the day. Simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyelids close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see beyond thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. I invite you to stand for the gospel. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 20, where Jesus says, Indeed, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing to pay the workers a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. He also went out about the third hour and saw others standing unemployed in the marketplace. To these he said, you also go into the vineyard and I will give you whatever is right. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. When he went out about the eleventh hour, he found others standing unemployed. He said to them, why have you stood here all day unemployed? They said to him, because no one hired us. He told them, you also go into the vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group and ending with the first. When those who were hired around the 11th hour came, they each received a denarius. When those who were hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but they each received a denarius too. After they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were last worked one hour, and you made them equal to us who have endured the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he answered one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not make an agreement with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. I want to give to the last one hired the same as I also gave to you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? In the same way, the last will be first, and the first last. The Gospel of the Lord. We speak the seasonal response together. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, Salvation unto us has come. Salvation unto us has come. 
by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom, they help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is the one Redeemer. What God does in his law demand, and none to him can render, brings wrath and woe on every hand, for man the vile offender. Our flesh has not those pure desires The Spirit of the law requires And lost is our condition It is a false misleading dream That God His law has given that sinners can themselves redeem and by their works gain heaven. The law is but a mirror bright to bring the inbred sin to light that lurks within our nature. Yet as the law must be fulfilled, or we must die despairing, Christ came and has God anger stilled, our human nature sharing. He has for us the law obeyed, and thus the Father's vengeance stayed which over us impended. Since Christ has full atonement made and brought to us salvation, each Christian therefore may be glad and build on this foundation. Your grace alone, dear Lord, I plead, your death is now my life indeed, for you have paid my ransom. O oh, blessing on earth, thanks and praise to Father, Son, and Spirit, the God who saved us by his grace, all glory to his merit. O oh, triune God in heaven above, you have revealed your saving love, your blessed name be hallowed. Grace. Grace to all of you, grace and peace from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the gospel lesson that was read, especially this verse, Matthew chapter 20, verse 15, where the master says, Can't I do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Dear friends in Christ Jesus, you never know where the gospel is going to break out. Take for the example the city of Joachimsthal. That's a city that's presently in the Czech Republic. Joachimsthal is spelled J O A C H I M S T H A L, Joachimsthal. And the story of Joachim's Tall is, is told in a book called Singing the Gospel by Christopher Boyd Brown. Joachim's Tall was founded 500 years ago, 1516, when silver was discovered in the hills right near, right just south of the present border of Germany and the Czech Republic. 
It was about 150 miles south of Wittenberg, where Martin Luther was. And 1516, that sounds like it might be a familiar date to you, at least 1517 could be, because 1517 is the date when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg. And so when those theses were published around Europe at that time, the Lutheran Reformation began. So Joachimsthal was founded about the same time as the Reformation. And when silver was discovered in those hills and a silver mine was set up, it was a big deal to move to Joachimsthal and get a job in the mine. Hundreds and then thousands of people did that. And that village grew up quickly. And because it was so near to Wittenberg and people were moving from the area of Germany where Martin Luther was, they set up a Lutheran church. It was the big church in town that everybody went to, the big new Lutheran church in Joachimsthal. Joachimsthal grew as a center for mining and they eventually put a mint there. No reason to take the silver anywhere else, just make the coins right there. And the coins that were made there, used all around Europe, wonderful silver coins, were called tallers, Joachim's tall, tallers. And it is the very place that we get our American word dollar from, from the dollar to the dollar. You can tell that's how important a place this was and how important those coins were. Because this congregation was filled with miners and the economy was good and all that silver was coming out of that mine, it was a relatively wealthy congregation and so they had enough money to set up a school. They set up a boys school and they were even so wealthy that they set up a separate girls school. The way education worked in those days, you didn't necessarily even have a school in your town. But when you had a boys' school, that was something. And when you had both a boys' and a girls' school, that put Joachim's tall on the map. It never occurred to them to put those two schools together. That's just not how you did education in those days. That congregation had a very good education program because they had that Lutheran elementary school, and they also had regular catechism classes for the students. In fact, because Luther's small catechism was published early in their history, and it said at the beginning of the catechism, this is for fathers to instruct their children in their homes, Joachim Stahl said, well, I guess that's the way it's supposed to be done. And so in every home, the parents were trained how you did home devotions and catechism instruction. It was just their way of life in Joachimsthal. We know all this because they were also very good record keepers. And so these primary source documents, these records were available to Christopher Boyd Brown as he told the history. The congregation there got together before the service on the first Sunday of the month to sing hymns. But they didn't show up just 10 minutes before the service to do that. They showed up an hour before the service. And in fact, they didn't sing just the first verse of the hymns. They sang all the verses of the hymns. And these hymns were the kind that were 10 or 15 or 20 verses. One of the hymns they sang was the hymn that we sang for the hymn of the day just before this sermon, Salvation Unto Us Has Come. And in fact, Christopher Boyd Brown tells the story of how the pastor taught all the fathers how you use that hymn to teach what the Bible says about Jesus. So he said, tonight when you have your home devotion, take the first verse of that hymn and talk about where that comes from in the scriptures and how it applies to our lives. And then tomorrow night use verse two and so on. So they use Luther's small catechism and they use the hymns to instruct their children. They got a couple of pastors along the way who not only led the people in singing those hymns, they wrote hymns of their own for the people to sing. Some of those hymns were so good that we still have them in our hymnal. Because you have hymnals, because we had our hymn sing before the service today, you might be able to look at hymn number 41, Let All Together Praise Our God. 
When you look at the small print at the bottom of the page, it says, text, Nicholas Herman, tune, Nicholas Herman. That's the pastor at Joachimsthal who wrote this hymn to instruct people on the truths of the faith. We still sing it today. In verse 5 of this hymn, this was uh, not a hymn that was just flowery language. This was great instruction about the Bible. Nicholas Herman wrote, He, that's Jesus, serves that I a Lord may be. That's kind of deep theology. I don't know if when we sing it, you quite catch on to what he's saying. He's taking the passage, For our sakes, Jesus became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. And he says, Jesus became a servant so that you could become a Lord, a person over the servant. Since we don't really have that system today, I don't know if you understand that language. But Jesus came, put himself under the law in order to serve us, in order to live a perfect life in our place, so that we are no longer bound by keeping the law in order to go to heaven. We don't have to worry about taking all the directions perfectly in order to earn our salvation. Jesus won that for us. So Nicholas Herman says, that's a great exchange indeed. And maybe you've heard me do the great exchange. When I talk about a four-part way to explain very simply what Jesus has done for us, and sometimes I move in front of the congregation in order to teach you this four-part way, maybe you remember this. Part one, you have to be perfect to go to heaven. Part two, God looks down from heaven and sees that no one is perfect. Part three, people realize that and try to do other things to get to heaven or pretend they're perfect. But part four, God, seeing that there's no other way, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life in our place, to take the punishment for our sins on the cross, to rise again, to prove that he is Lord of all, that he's in control of our lives, that we are forgiven All of that is summarized in that term, great exchange. God made the one who had no sin be sin for us, so that in him we become the righteousness of God. All of my sin is put on Jesus, and through faith in him, I have his perfect life credited to my account. That's my ticket to heaven. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to, my, to his cross I cling, we sing. That's the great exchange. The people in Joachim's tall knew the great exchange. Nicholas Herman could just use that phrase in verse 5. Could Jesus' love do more for me to help me in my need? And they would all know what he was talking about. Nicholas Herman's other hymn in our hymnal is 308, 308. As surely as I live, God said, where he talks about repentance and forgiveness, a proper understanding of turning from wickedness and evil and receiving Jesus' righteousness through faith in him. Verse six, when ministers lay on their hands, absolved by Christ, the sinner stands. He who by grace the word believes, forgiveness sure and sweet receives. The people sang those hymns often enough that they knew them by heart. They learned them in the school and had them as memory work. The choirs sang them in church. The people sang them in the hymn sing and would whistle them, would sing them on the way to and from the mine, very well known in Joachim's tall, not just for six months, not just as long as Pastor Herman was there. The documents of Joachim's tall shows that this was their identity as a Lutheran congregation for 100 years, for five generations. This is just how it worked in that congregation, that all of these truths of scriptures were prayed and sung and memorized and passed on from generation to generation. And you might think that was just because it was their identity or a tradition. But they had another reason. Their faith and the existence of their congregation as a Lutheran church was constantly in danger because they lived on a border in Europe. 
I don't know how good your world history is, but when you live on a border between two countries in Europe, it could be that that border is going to be moved pretty easily, that there's going to be some kind of revolution or army coming through, and you all was in that place. They lived on a border, and they're a mining town. So if I'm a king or an emperor, another kind of ruler, and I want to gain a mine that has silver and a mint, why, well, I should probably conquer Joachim's tall. And sure enough, a hundred years after they were founded, they were right in the middle of what historians call the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. And in the Thirty Years' War, the Roman Catholic Church raised armies together with an emperor and said, we're going to take back the lands where the Lutheran church has become strong, and we're going to take all of these Lutheran church lands and make them Roman Catholic again. And so Joachim's tall had the Catholic army come through, and the defending uh, Lutheran armies come back, and the Catholic armies come through, and finally, Catholics gain control of that land that is Joachim's tall. And they didn't just close down the Lutheran church there. They put a Roman Catholic priest in charge of the Lutheran churches that they took over. And not just any Roman Catholic priest, but a Roman Catholic priest trained to deal with what they called those pernicious Lutheran doctrines. In fact, the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic church had arisen to train those kind of priests. And kind of famous in Lutheran church history, they put a man named Franciscus Albanus into the pulpit at Joachim's Tall. He had been trained by the Jesuits for a decade to deal with Lutheran pernicious doctrines. And so when he arrived in that town, he said, no more teaching Luther's small catechism in the school. The people prepared for that had practiced teaching that in their homes. And they continued to teach the truth of God's word in their homes. Franciscus Albanus said, we're not going to do this Lutheran worship thing where you've taken out parts of what the Roman Catholic Church has for Sunday morning liturgy. We're going to do the full Roman Catholic liturgy. But wherever those Roman Catholic liturgies had false doctrine, the Lutherans who gathered for worship just refused to sing or speak during those parts. And then during the parts they knew were from the scripture, those were the parts with which they participated in the service. It was obviously uh, distressing to the new priest put in at Joachim's Tal. He wrote to others and said, what do you think I should do? The advice he got was, Yes, many of the Lutheran books have been burned, but you are, you've told us that the church library still has those Lutheran books in it, even though you've locked it up. You yourself need to go to those Lutheran books, Albanus, and you need to research what's wrong and then just teach the people what's wrong, what the false doctrines are that Lutherans teach. Albanus wrote all of this down, so we know his personal history from his own autobiography. And he said, I went into that library and for three years I researched from Luther's own writings what was wrong from the scripture. I could not find a single thing wrong from the scripture. And so I emerged from that study and said to the congregation, I will no longer be Roman Catholic. I will be Lutheran because what Lutherans teach is true. And Jesus is my savior through faith in him not any good works. In fact, Albanus said, take the workers in the vineyard from Matthew chapter 20. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that if you do what the church says, you get a little bit of grace and God will pay you and the more you do, the more you'll get paid and you can accumulate all kinds of things, a treasury of merits with God that if you're good enough, you can even have those given to other people by the proper sacrifice of masses and doing purgatory and so on. And Albana said, clearly the scripture says that's not right. God blesses people because he is generous, not because they have done anything to earn favor in his eyes. In fact, even though it doesn't seem fair, God blesses all people equally through faith in Christ Jesus. 
whether they come to faith by baptism as infants or whether they come to faith by conversion on their deathbeds, they receive the same benefit, full forgiveness, full and free, the promise of heaven, eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord, no strings attached. That's what the scripture teaches. That's what the workers in the vineyard teaches. It teaches that salvation comes to us not because of our own works, but because God is generous. It's still true today, you know. And I'm not sure that you thought, any of you thought that you were getting to heaven by your good works or by your connection to the church or by your earning graces from God. Grace is not something that is earned. When a man works, his pay, his wage, is credited to him as a gift, as an obligation. But God does not give us forgiveness, life, and salvation as pay. He does it by grace. And if it's by grace, it's no longer by works. It's because he is generous. But I do know that many of us struggle with unresolved feelings of guilt. You know, our houses haven't been like the houses at Joachim's Tal. We haven't done all of those devotions the way they did. We haven't kept God's word purely taught. We haven't been able to come to worship the way that we wanted. Or, in the back of my mind, I still have things, I still want to do things I know are wrong. Whether that is bearing grudges, keeping anger, or more gross sins of the flesh. These are the things that make me feel guilty all the time. I'd like to keep them a secret. God does not forgive us because we have figured out the best time for repentance or because we have figured out to make up for whatever deficiencies we have in our life. God forgives us because he is generous. And his forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ is complete and certain and it's for all of our sins, regardless of whether we feel guilty about them or not. His forgiveness is based on the work of Jesus for us. And so as far as he's concerned, he's forgotten our sins. They are as far from him as east is from the west. They are gone. They are removed. He looks at us as his own dear children. And that's the message we continue to proclaim. Why should God bless the proclamation of that message in this congregation? We are certainly not perfect, and we face our own hindrances. It's the pandemic now. People have found reason not to come to worship anymore, and it's gone beyond because I'm afraid of the illness. It's gone more to it's not my habit anymore. Why should this congregation continue to reach out to people who've never paid attention to religion before, who may have philosophies that are the opposite of what God teaches, who may not look like us, who may not talk like us, who may be living lives, well, like the tax collectors and sinners? Why should this congregation continue to preach and teach the word of God in its truth and purity when it would be so easy to teach something more palatable, more understandable, more quickly lovable? Why does God bless what we do in our half-hearted ways? Because he is generous. It is his mercy, his love, his grace that continues to move us to reach out with his word, to speak it clearly and truthfully, to support the work of our congregation in this difficult time. Why should we expect God to bless us as we do those things? Because he is generous. And you never know when his gospel is going to break out and bring many more to work in his vineyard, to labor, 
and then to receive the blessing of forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that transcends understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. may be seated for the Wells Connection.
that we have a remembrance of your visit and drop it in the offering plate of the way of the Lord. Next Sunday, regular 1030 worship, but for the Bible class in between, it won't be a confirmation Bible class we've had for the last few weeks. Instead, it'll be a special one-time Bible class on the book of Hebrews. The following week, we'll have outdoor worship at whether allowing, so there's no Sunday school or Bible class only a picnic after church. Inside your bulletin in the insert, there's a worship survey. So, there are about 35 of you here this morning. There are about 70 of you here in the service. So that's twice as many as you, but think of tripling your current attendance here. And then the question is, do you want to have just one service at 9 o'clock? Or do you want to continue with two services? Are you, most, are you more comfortable with the social distancing available in the sanctuary in second service? Or would you like to be worshiping with that larger group? It's such an interesting question. If you get the church email, there's 